good day, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Madison's first quarter 2023 financial results conference call. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you'll need to press star 11 on your telephone. You will then hear an automated message advising your hand is raised. To answer your question, please press star 11 again. Please be advised today's conference is being recorded. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker for today, Justin Schoenberg, Director of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Lisa. Joining me on the call today are Matt Cox, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, and Joel Winnie, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Slides from this presentation are available for download at our website, www.matson.com, under the Investors tab. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that during the course of this call, we will make forward-looking statements within the meaning of the federal securities laws regarding expectations, predictions, projections, or future events. We believe that our expectations and assumptions are reasonable. We caution you to consider the risk factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from those in the forward-looking statements in the press release, the presentation slides, and this conference call. These risk factors are described in our press release and presentation and are more fully detailed under the caption risk factors on pages 14 to 24 of our Form 10-K filed on February 24, 2023 and in our subsequent filings with the SEC. Please also note that the date of this conference call is February 20, 2024 and any forward-looking statements that we make today are based on assumptions as of this date we undertake no obligation to update these forward-looking statements. I will now turn the call over to Matt. Okay. Thanks, Justin, and thanks to those on the call. I'll be starting on slide three. Matson's ocean transportation and logistics business segments performed well in the fourth quarter, capping off a solid year for both business segments. Matson's in a solid operational and financial position, We are the leading expedited ocean freight provider in the Trans-Pacific, and we're well positioned for growth in our Jones Act and logistics markets. Our balance sheet is strong with a low-cost capital structure and low leverage. We're in very good funding position on our new Aloha-class vessels with the program two-thirds funded at year-end with approximately $600 million in our capital construction fund. And lastly, we returned approximately $203 million to shareholders in 2023 in the form of share repurchases and dividends. For the fourth quarter within ocean transportation, our China service experienced solid freight demand with higher year-over-year volume but lower year-over-year rates, which when combined with higher operating costs across all trade lanes resulted in a year-over-year decline in operating income. In logistics, operating income declined year over year primarily due to a lower contribution from transportation brokerage. I will now go through fourth quarter performance of our trade lanes, SSAT, and logistics, so please turn to the next slide. Hawaii container volume for the fourth quarter declined 1.9% year over year due to lower general demand. Volume in the fourth quarter of 2023 was 5.1% lower than volume achieved in the fourth quarter of 2019. Tourist arrivals in the fourth quarter were modestly lower year over year as tourism to Maui was impacted by wildfires. For the full year 2023, container volume decreased 3% year over year, primarily due to lower general westbound demand and lower eastbound volume. For the full year 2024, we expect volume to be comparable to the level in 2023, reflecting modest economic growth in Hawaii and stable market share. Please turn to slide five. The Hawaii economy held up well in 2023, despite high interest rates, high inflation, a modest decline in population, and headwinds to tourism from the Maui wildfires and the slow return of international visitors. 
According to UHERO's December economic report, the Hawaii economy is predicted to grow modestly in 2024, underpinned by a low unemployment rate and easing inflation. Construction jobs are projected to increase due in large part from government-related projects, as well as initial rebuilding efforts in Maui. Near-term growth in visitor arrivals is expected to be challenging due to reduced tourism to Maui as a result of the wildfires last year and sluggish recovery of international tourism. Moving to our China service on slide six, Matson's volume in the fourth quarter of 2023 was 23.3% higher year over year, primarily due to higher demand for the China service, resulting in higher volumes for both the CLX and CLX Plus. We achieved average freight rates in the quarter that were lower than the year ago period, but well above those achieved in the fourth quarter of 2019. For the full year 2023, Container volume decreased 13.7% year-over-year, primarily due to the CCX volume in the first nine months of 2022. Recall that we discontinued the CCX service in the third quarter of 2022. Please turn to slide seven. Currently, in the Trans-Pacific marketplace, we continue to see steady U.S. consumer demand. As is typical in the Trans-Pacific trade lane, Our CLX and CLX Plus vessels experienced light volume coming out of the Christmas and New Year period, but near capacity as we approach Lunar New Year. We expect the post-Lunar New Year period to be more traditional, with factories closed for a couple of weeks, the workforce slowly returning to work. As we did in the prior year, we decided not to sail the CLX Plus vessels from Shanghai for a few weeks because the cargo package could be accommodated with a weekly CLX departure. We currently expect volume demand to gradually recover over a four to six week period as factories return to normal post holiday. For a full year 2024, we expect similar demand for our CLX and CLX plus services as in 23 and average freight rates to be modestly higher and above pre-pandemic freight rate levels. To date, our China service has seen a very limited effect from the supply chain disruptions caused by the Panama Canal drought and the events in the Red Sea. Depending on the duration and evolution of these situations, it's possible we could see further impact on our expedited ocean services. We know more customers are evaluating their shipping options in light of these events but we're not aware of any material changes to our customers' cargo routing. Regardless of the uncertainty of these and other events, we're focused on maintaining the two fastest and most reliable ocean services in the Trans-Pacific. Lastly, on February 18th, we renamed the CLX Plus service to the MAX, Matson Asia Express. CLX Plus was introduced in 2020 to accommodate extraordinary demand for Matson's expedited Trans-Pacific service during the pandemic and has had industry-leading performance for the last four years. We've rebranded the CLX Plus to MAX to reflect this highly differentiated service, including a recently added sixth ship that provides scheduled flexibility to ensure a weekly departure from China. MAX is the only liner service in the Trans-Pacific trade lane providing customers with this unique service element. Please turn to the next slide. In Guam, Matson's container volume in the fourth quarter of 2023 increased 2% over the year over year. The increase was primarily due to higher general demand. Volume in the fourth quarter of 2023 was 4.2% higher than the level achieved in the fourth quarter of 2019. For the full year 2023, container volume decreased 4.7% due to lower general demand. In the near term, we expect continued improvement in the Guam economy with low unemployment rate and a modest increase in tourism. For 2024, we expect container volume to approximate the level achieved last year. Please turn to the next slide. In Alaska, 
Matson's container volume for the fourth quarter of 2023 decreased 0.6% year over year. The decrease was due to lower export seafood volume from AAX, partially offset by higher northbound volume due to an additional sailing and higher southbound volume due to higher domestic seafood volume. Compared to the fourth quarter of 2019, volume in the quarter was 20.3% higher. For the full year 2024, we expect Alaska volume to approximate the level achieved last year. Please turn to slide 10. The Alaska economy continues to show good economic growth and improvement in key economic indicators despite flattish growth in population. In 2023, the state saw widespread job growth across almost every industry, and the Alaska Department of Labor projects continued job growth in 2024. In the near term, we expect the Alaska economy to grow supported by low unemployment, job growth, and lower levels of inflation. The state's economy is also expected to benefit in the near and medium term from increased energy-related exploration and production activity, as well as significant infrastructure investment funded by the Federal Infrastructure Bill by the Inflation Reduction Act. Please turn to slide 11. Our terminal joint venture, SSAT, increased $3.1 million year over year to $4.1 million. The higher contribution was primarily due to higher lift revenue, partially offset by lower demurrage revenue. For the full year 2023, SSAT contributed $2.2 million, reflecting a year over year decrease of $80.9 million primarily due to lower demerge revenue. In 2024, we expect contributions to be higher from increased lift volumes. Turning now to logistics on slide 12, operating income in the fourth quarter came in at $8.9 million, or approximately $3.9 million lower than the result in the year ago period. The DQ, D, the decrease was primarily due to a lower contribution from transportation brokerage. For the full year 2023, operating income was $48 million, reflecting a year-over-year -year decrease of $24.4 million. The decrease was due to a lower contribution from transportation brokerage and supply chain management. For 2024, we expect operating income to be lower than the level achieved in 2023. For transportation brokerage, we expect challenging business conditions at least through the first half of 2024. We expect demand for our freight forwarding, supply chain management, and warehousing business lines to be comparable to 2023. And I will now turn the call over to Joel for a review of our financial performance. Joel. Okay, thanks, Matt. Please turn to slide 13 for a review of our fourth quarter and full year 2023 results. For the fourth quarter, consolidated operating income decreased $17.3 million year-over-year -year to $75.3 million, with lower contributions from ocean transportation and logistics of $13.4 million and $3.9 million, respectively. The decrease in ocean transportation operating income in the fourth quarter was primarily due to lower freight rates in China and higher operating costs and expenses, including fuel-related expenses partially offset by higher volume in China and higher contributions from Alaska and Hawaii. As Matt just noted, the decrease in logistics operating income was primarily due to a lower contribution from transportation brokerage. We had interest income of $9.8 million in the quarter due to higher investment rates on our cash and cash equivalents and deposits in the CCF as compared to the prior year period. Interest expense in the quarter decreased $1.3 million year over year due to the decline in outstanding debt in the past year. The effective tax rate in the quarter was 26% compared to 20.4% in the year ago period. For the full year, consolidated operating income decreased $1.01 billion year over year to $342.8 million with lower contributions from ocean transportation and logistics of $986.4 million and $24.4 million, respectively. The decrease in ocean transportation operating income for the year 
was primarily due to lower freight rates and volume in China and a lower contribution from SSAT, partially offset by lower operating costs and expenses, including fuel-related expenses, primarily related to the discontinuation of the CCX service and lower fuel costs and the timing of fuel-related surcharge collections. The decrease in logistics operating income was primarily due to lower contributions from transportation brokerage and supply chain management. Please turn to the next slide. The slide shows how we allocated our trailing 12 months of cash flow generation. For the LTM period, we generated cash flow from operations of approximately 510.5 million, from which we used 76.9 million to retire debt, 195.5 million on maintenance and other CapEx, 52.9 million on new vessel capex, including capitalized interest and owner's items, 78.6 million in cash deposits and interest income into CCF, net of withdrawals from, from milestone payments, 23.8 million on other cash outflows, while returning approximately 200.2 million to shareholders via dividends and share repurchase. Please turn to slide 15 for a summary of our share repurchase program and balance sheet. During the fourth quarter, we repurchased approximately 0.5 million shares for a total cost of 47.9 million, including taxes. For the full year 2023, we repurchased approximately 2.1 million shares for a total cost of 158.2 million. Since we initiated our share repurchase program in August 2021, through December of 2023, we repurchased 9.5 million shares or 21.9% of our stock for a total cost of approximately 755 million. As we have said before, we are committed to returning excess capital to shareholders and plan to continue to do so in the absence of any large organic or inorganic growth investment opportunities. Turning to our debt levels, our total debt at the end of the fourth quarter was 440.6 million, a reduction of 9.7 million from the end of the third quarter. For the, for the year, we have reduced total debt by 76.9 million. I'm now going to walk through an update of a couple of, of financial items, so please turn to the next slide. The cash balance in the capital construction fund at the end of 2023 was 599.4 million. Based on the remaining milestone payments of 899 million, Nearly two-thirds of the program at year-end was funded by restricted cash in the CCF. Note that the two-thirds figure excludes interest income on cash deposits that may be earned in future years. We currently expect to make milestone payments of $35.5 million in each of the second and fourth quarters of this year. Also, we, re we recently executed a strategy to term out a portion of the CCF cash deposits held in short-term U.S. government money market funds with the purchase of approximately $450 million in fixed-rate U.S. treasuries to align with milestone payments in 2025, 2026, and, 20 and 2027. The effective yield of this fixed-rate portfolio is 4.53% with an effective duration of 1.9 years. By executing this term out strategy, approximately half of the remaining 899 million in milestone payments are in fixed rate instruments, providing a greater certainty around the amount of tax deductible interest income we can expect to receive over the next few years. And the balance of the deposits in the CCF remain in short term investments of 90 days duration or less. Lastly, we continue to expect to receive a general corporate tax refund of $119 million for 2021 federal taxes. Please turn to slide 17. The table on the slide summarizes our $248.4 million in capital expenditures in 2023. We had capitalized construction expenditures of $52.9 million, which consisted of milestone payments and other related costs on our new Aloha class vessels. Maintenance and other capital expenditures were $195.5 million, of which $71.9 million was for equipment to support network requirements and growth. $66.1 million was for the LNG installations on the Daniel K. Inouye in Kamanahiva and the LNG installation re-engineering of Monokai. And $57.5 million was for other maintenance capex across a variety of projects. 
Please turn to the next slide. Slide 18 shows the key capital expenditures planned over the next three years. For 2024, we expect total CapEx of 255 to 275 million, of which 110 to 120 million is for maintenance and other CapEx, including phase two and phase three work at Sand Island in Honolulu and normal course capital expenditures to support our vessel, our vessels, shoreside operations, and logistics businesses. 70 to 80 million for LNG installations and re-engineering of Monokai, and 75 million for new vessel construction expenditures, including capitalized interest and owner's items. The LNG projects for Monokai and Kamanahila remain on track for the vessels to return to service later this year. For 2025, we expect slightly lower year-over-year -year maintenance and other capital expenditures, trending to our maintenance level of 80 to 90 million in 2026. We also expect the remaining payments on the LNG projects in early 2025. And new vessel capital expenditures are projected to increase materially in 2025 and 2026 as our project advances into the construction phases on all three vessels at the Philly shipyard. With that, let me now turn to slide 19 and walk through our outlook for the full year and first quarter of 2024. For 2024, we expect year-over-year -year growth in ocean transportation operating income. As in a significant change in trajectory of the U.S. economy, we expect trade dynamics across all our trade lanes to be comparable to 2023 as co consumer-related spending activity is expected to remain stable. For logistics, we expect challenging business conditions for transportation brokerage at least through the first half of the year, which we expect to lead to lower year-over-year -year business segment operating income. As a result, we expect consolidated operating income to approximate the level achieved in the prior year with a quarterly seasonality pattern consistent with 2023. In addition to this full year operating income outlook, we expect the following for the full year. Depreciation and amortization to approximate 180 million, inclusive of 24 million for dry dock amortization. Interest income to be approximately 35 million and interest expense to be approximately $8 million, other income to be approximately $7 million, an effective tax rate of approximately 22%, and dry docking payments of approximately $35 million. The interest income outlook we are providing is based on the current CCF deposits and cash and cash equivalents invested at current short-term government money market rates, as well as the CCF fixed rate portfolio yielding 4.53%. This outlook does not factor in the cash and interest income from the expected tax refund. For the first quarter of 2024, we expect ocean transportation operating income to be lower than the 27.8 million achieved in the first quarter of 2023, and logistics operating income to be lower than the 10.9 million achieved in the first quarter of 2023. As such, we expect consolidating operating income in the first quarter to be lower than the prior year. The first quarter has historically been our weakest period in the year due to seasonality in our Jones Act trading lanes and a slower period of activity in our China business due to the post-Lunar New Year period. As for logistics, as I noted earlier, we expect challenging business conditions for transportation brokerage at least through the first half of the year. I'll now turn the call back over to Matt. Okay, thanks Joel. Please turn to slide 20 where I'll go through some closing thoughts. As I mentioned in my introductory comments, Matson's in a very good position operationally and financially. The strength of the Matson brand is a testament to our market positioning across both business segments and the collective efforts of our employees to serve the needs of our customers. We close 2023 in a strong financial position we have low-cost investment-grade balance sheet, which we view as a competitive advantage to pursue growth opportunities as they present themselves. Two-thirds of the current remaining milestone payments in our new vessel built program is funded with cash deposits in the capital construction fund. We completed one LNG vessel project, and by the end of the year, we expect the remaining two LNG vessel projects to be finished with those vessels back in service. There will always be some degree of uncertainty and noise, but we remain focused on what we can control. First and foremost, we're focused on vessel schedule integrity, 
reliability of our operation, and delivering high quality service for our customers. This focus has served our company well for 141 years and remains the foundation of our success moving forward. We will continue to maintain discipline in our capital allocation strategy. We invest your capital for the long term to create value. And in some cases, we are making capital decisions for many decades, like our new Aloha class vessel build program. We currently expect these vessels to be in service in late 2026 through 2027. After that, we do not expect to build any additional vessels until the mid-2030s. We have steadily built a portfolio of high-quality businesses through organic pursuits and acquisitions. We're always looking for natural extensions to our businesses and to leverage the Matson brand. But we're also attentive to the returns on capital and long-term cash flow characteristics of pursuing growth. And last but not least, we will continue to return capital to shareholders after funding our maintenance of capital expenditures, long-term investments, and dividend. Since 2021, when we initiated our share repurchase program, we repurchased 9.5 million shares, or nearly 22% of the then shares outstanding for 755 million. Going forward, we expect to be steady buyers of our shares. And with that, I will turn the call back to the operator and ask for your questions. Thank you. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 11 on your telephone. One moment while we compile the Q&A roster, and please wait for your name to be announced before you proceed with your question. One moment, please. Our first question for the day will be coming from Jacob Black of Wolf Research. Your line is open. Hey, Matt. Hey, Joel. Thanks for your time. Hey, Jacob. Hi, Jake. So, so I, I just wanted to dig into the 1Q guidance a bit. Uh, I guess what, what's driving the lower year-on-year -year operating income in ocean? And, and then, you know, we, we've seen a big increase in Trans-Pacific Ocean spot rates to start the year. And, you know, I, I know your expedited rates are, are a little different. Do you, do you think there's just a pricing lag there? Or, or is there some other reason why, why this wouldn't impact your price as well? Yes, Jake, it's Joe. I'll take that. So the, the biggest thing we expect a little bit lighter volumes than we had last year on on the China business. Um, the rates, as Matt mentioned, are a little bit higher than we had into la than we were in the first quarter of last year. But on a year over year basis, it's the volume impact that'll probably be the bigger the bigger change there. Uh, our junk jack businesses are more or less um, in similar places on a year over year basis. So it's primarily the China business. And then the other part of your question there is. Is the rate environment? And Matt, Matt can add in here too. But what we what we've said here is that we haven't seen really any uh, material impact on our China business based upon the Red Sea or other um, events in the ocean, in international ocean shipping. So even though some of the uh, commodity price indices like the SCFI and Asia Europe rates are higher, that's not necessarily impacting our expedited segment. Yeah, is that just seasonality the year on year? Volumes being lower in the first quarter. Yes, uh, it's, I mean it's really it's really annual seasonality. Yes, around around post lunar New Year, um, and we're seeing a little bit more a little bit less volume this year than than, than last year. Yeah. So Jake, this is Matt. I would just add a little more color. I think um, we see the pattern that's emerging in 2024 in the first quarter around lunar New Year, as Joel mentioned, to be much more traditional. Um, the this is really the first year in four years uh, that um, People have had a chance to return to their their homes uh, and are taking advantage of kind of a longer shutdown period uh, that were abbreviated during the pandemic for for various reasons. And so it, it's more a return to normal than than I would say anything that is uh, of concern to us about our outlook, which is in part why we still think that the full year uh, we're going to have a year that looks a lot like on a consolidated basis the year we just finished in 2023. Got it. Uh, okay, that's helpful. And then uh, on a sequential basis in 4Q, it looks like operating expenses stepped up uh, despite lower volumes. W what were the big buckets driving that? Well, the, on the 4 on the 4Q, Jake, volumes are actually up quite a bit in China. So we did have higher terminal handling costs, and we also had we also had higher fuel costs. 
um, particularly in our domestic trade lanes on a year-over-year -year basis. And, and there's, also, there's also an issue of year-over-year -year timing of collections. So we, um, we, we had a little bit more collections on a timing basis in Q4 of 2022, a little bit less in 2023. So there's actual fuel price, fuel, timing of fuel collections, and volumes in the China business were the biggest drivers of okay, the Okay, so price. I was thinking sequentially um, from 3Q to 4Q. Oh, uh, sequentially? Um, yeah, the biggest issue there was fuel, the timing of fuel and fuel collections. Fuel. Okay. Got it. Okay. And then, you know, it seems like we've just, in terms of broader ocean, it seems like we've seen a, a, some shift of West Coast imports back, or East Coast imports back to the West Coast. Uh, is, is this impacting SSAT at all? Does this help get profitability back towards pre-COVID levels? I, I guess, what do we need to get SSAT yeah, back it's, it's towards? A good yeah, it, Jake, it's a good question. I think um, certainly we know our customers are looking closely at you know, we talked about the Red Sea, we talked about the drought in the Panama Canal, the ILA contract renewal. These are all factors that I think are going to inform our customers' decisions around how they're going to route their cargo into the U.S., the imports. Now, many of our customers have multiple distribution centers and can, can select uh, where they want to have the imports focused. Um, what I would say is while we know customers are looking closely at these fa various factors, so far, we haven't seen any significant movement uh, of, of customer moves uh, in that direction, um, although, uh, and nor have we seen any significant changes in deployed capacity by the international ocean carriers. But I do expect that we will see, at a minimum, a return of that cargo which, which moved off of the West Coast when the ILWU contract was renewed in 2023. So we do expect uh, some volume to return to the West Coast that, that had left during the ILW contract renewal. Uh, the extent and, and, and amount um, are unclear and not yet present, but we do, we do expect uh, some increased volume as a result of some of that as the year progresses in 24. Yeah, that, that's helpful. Thanks for your time. Sure, thank you. Thanks, Jane. Thank you. One moment for the next question. And our next question will be coming from Ben Nolan. Uh, Steve, well, your line is open. Hey, Joel, Matt. Long time to talk. Hi, ben. Um, hey, uh, so I, I wanted to dig in a little bit on, I, I know on the slide number seven, you talk about demand for CLX and CLX Plus, or I guess the max service now, um, to approximate what it was last year. And it could just be me being seeing more into this than is really there, but I, normally you're talking about volumes approximating um, your rear levels here. It sort of says demand, and I know you talked about adding a six ship as sort of a spare. Uh, is it fair to say that you were, there, there may be some demand that you missed out on because of whatever, you just didn't have enough equipment in place, and now you have a little bit more equipment, so actually even if demand is equal, your volume could be higher next year, or, or am I just reading too much into that? Yeah, I, let, let me uh, take a crack at that. Um, so I, fr from our expectation of what we know now, um, of course, we'll have two weekly departures, uh, you know, for, for, the, for the full year 2024, as we did in the 2023, except for the handful of CLX plus now max uh, voyages post Lunar New Year when the expedited, our expedited market demand could be accommodated by the single sailing of the CLX service. So what, I think what you'll see, and we were effectively full once we ramped ourselves back up um, at, at, after this post Lunar New Year period. So we expect set, there really is no fundamental changes in, in our expectation at this point about the number of voyages. That sixth ship we've added uh, we do not expect will be the result in additional voyage. That, that vessel is there to stand by as a reserve if either the CLX or the MAX service, because of a weather event or some other circumstance, is not able to sail uh, to ensure an on-time departure that our customers rely on uh, and are willing to pay for the, through the, our premium rate structure. So I, I don't think you're going to see a 
we're not thinking that there's going to be any significant uh, additional capacity that's introduced in a very similar profile in terms of how our ships are going to fill up as the year goes on. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, and then if I could just sticking with the uh, with the China side, you, you talk about in the on slide number seven there, uh, freight rates being a little bit higher in 2024 than you are in 2023. I'm curious how much of that is contract versus just sort of your expectation for what the, the spot would look like. Um, well, I'll take the, the, the first part of that first, Ben, which is that the, the, what we're saying about, we're not necessarily saying the rates will be higher in the entire year. What we're saying is right now, rates are at a higher okay. point in January were, were the, than they were last January, February. Um, and, then they, and then they found their pricing level after the Lunar New Year ramp up toward the end of February into March, April. And then they were pretty consistent throughout the year as we reported throughout the year. So what we're saying in general is that the overall demand on the, on the volume and rate side should not be that uh, different in the China business. But, but that said, except January and February, the rates were higher than where we started. So that's the comment about rates for the whole year. And then the, comp, then the question on contracts, uh, we don't see a significant change in the percentage of contracts. Um, we, we certainly have important contracts with our customers, but the majority of the freight still moves as freight forwarders on short-term, short-term, one, two, three-week out basis. Okay, all right. Uh, and then last for me, just on um, Alaska, you mentioned it a little bit, um, doing or, or anticipating perhaps a little bit more business from drilling activity and, and energy activity in Alaska. Oh, and, and that was, had always been, as I recall, a market where you say, you know, there, there might be more touch points that you could add in time as part of the logistics program uh, are either organically or inorganically uh, are, are there opportunities emerging uh, to you know add to what you're doing in the Alaska business here? Uh, yeah, I think the short answer is yes. I, I think we um, as we as we talked about in our prepared comments, I, I do feel like um, maps and since the acquisition five, six years ago, have really focused on two areas of, of uh, growth, <clears throat> or three. One, of course, was the acquisition of Span Alaska in our logistics business, and, and that business has continued to grow faster than the market. Uh, we've invested in new uh, distribution facilities, uh, two in the state, one in Anchorage and one in Fairbanks, that have uh, led to strong growth in that uh, segment. But on the ocean transportation side, Really, there are two segments that we, we focused on. One is um, the, uh, in the oil and gas segment that Horizon Lines, our previous uh, company, had not uh, focused very much on, and uh, we, we are now seeing it as a growing component of our freight flows. And right now, uh, the dynamics in Alaska uh, for exploration and production are good. Uh, and we're aware of uh, our customers looking at large multi-year projects, and we expect to benefit uh, from th that additional volume in drilling and uh, production. The other one, of course, is the seafood exports um, outside of, of uh, on the Aleutian Islands, in Kodiak and Dutch Harbor, primarily to international seafood uh, markets and buyers in Asia uh, in, in, in our scope of services. And so those are the two verticals that we've seen most directly that uh, that we've grown ourselves into, and frankly, we continue to see more growth opportunities uh, in both of those segments moving forward. All right, I uh, appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press star one one on your telephone. One moment for the next question. And our next question. We'll be coming from Jack Atkins of Stevens. Your line is open. Hey, guys. This is Grant on for Jack. Uh, thank you for taking my questions. Um, you know, Matt, you mentioned natural extensions to the Matson brand. You know, previously, I think you guys had talked about that likely with com coming within the logistics segment. Uh, could you maybe just kind of update us on what you're seeing related to logistics M&A targets, and, you know, or maybe are you seeing opportunities in other trade lanes like South China on the ocean transportation side, perhaps as it relates to, to the events in the Red Sea? Thanks. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, I, I would say that uh, where we look at, at brand extensions, uh, I, I would say we would look to our past to look at both um, organic growth initiatives, whether it's uh, our fleet of 
uh, 53-foot rail uh, boxes, uh, growth in uh, those rail services uh, in and out of Mexico, for example, is a, is a new vertical. That's an organic growth initiative. Um, we've done some small tuck-in acquisitions in the Alaska service. Um, and and while, we, while, while we see valuations as continued to be elevated in logistics businesses or base their financial forecasts on elevated uh, profit forecasts that were born out of the uh, the pandemic boom, um, we do, uh, you know, keep a, a watchful eye on good quality businesses that fit our investment profile. Um, I would say right now, there's, the, uh, well, we're going to keep a close eye on it. We think valuations are still relatively elevated uh, and beyond our underwriting capability. Um, to your point about China, we, we um, expanded our service offering, uh, connecting with partners to have direct services from Vietnam, which connect over Shanghai to meet our CLX or our MAX services. We expect continued growth in, um, in, in uh, working with partners to expand the origins of our business out of China into a near, uh, near mar nearby markets. So those are just a couple of examples of ways in which we expect to continue to grow over time. Okay, great. Thank you guys for the time. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you, Grant. Thank you. And that does conclude the Q&A session for the day. I would now like to turn the conference back over to Matt Cox, CEO, for closing remarks. Please go ahead. Okay, thanks, Operator. Uh, thanks for tuning in today. We look forward to catching up with everyone at the first quarter call. Aloha. This does conclude today's conference call. Thank you all for joining. You may disconnect.